Can I advise members that question number 10 has been withdrawn? I now call Declan McAleer. Question over a hand, question one. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, with your permission, I would wish to group questions number one, two and four. And again, with your permission, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to avail of the extra minute uh, to answer uh, this grouping. I am delighted that Project Stratum, delivered through the DUP Confidence and Supply Deal, is now up and running. Project Stratum will utilise public funding together with Fibrous Networks investment to deliver gigabyte capable broadband infrastructure to more than 76,000 primarily rural premises across Northern Ireland. The citizens and businesses in these areas have waited all too far too long for acceptable broadband and their struggles have been deepened by the COVID-19 crisis. As some 97% of these premises are classed as Nisra Band H, which is settlements of less than 1,000 and open countryside, the entire intervention area is a priority for my department. Deployment work is already underway. That is very significant, as within the nine-month period initially thought to be required for network design, some 19,000 premises will have been passed. I appreciate that members want to know how Project Stratum will impact on their areas. My department is engaging with Fibrous Networks to ensure that citizens and businesses can access further information regarding de deployment plans and project implementation dates. An online portal has been developed by Fibrous Networks to provide this key information throughout the deployment phase of the project. Details of the deployment plan are now available on the portal and a premises checker will be added over the coming weeks. Links to the Hyperfast NI portal can be found on both my department's and Fibrous' website. The portal will be updated and expanded as the project progresses. I understand that members may feel disappointed that their areas are further into the rollout cycle than maybe they would have preferred, but I would ask for patience in this regard. It is vital that the network is designed with technical and economic efficiency. That will enable as many premises as possible to benefit from the intervention. I hope that members will agree that the important message for citizens and businesses is that a solution is now in reach and all those premises that were struggling to reach uh, acceptable broadband uh, will uh, be uh, served with this intervention, making them among the best served places for broadband in the United Kingdom and indeed throughout Europe. I can also assure members that the management structure for Project Stratum contains the required tiers of project oversight to support robust governance procedures. These include a project board and project management team, the project board will monitor progress. The three and minutes is up some time ago. Sorry, it's a lot of information to be got out. I call Declan McAleer for supplementary. I thank the minister for her very comprehensive response. And like many other MLAs, particularly those represent rural areas like I do in West Tyrone, which is in the Spurns, we're all itching to know when it's going to come to our local town or village. But I suppose the, the question that I want to ask the minister was that whenever the project stratum was conceived at the outset, it was estimated that the number of premises that hadn't got access to fast broadband was over 100,000, whereas Project Stratum now uh, targets 76,000. So I just want the Minister to explain that gap and if indeed there is a, a solution for those, what it looks like 30,000 premises won't, that aren't currently part of the Project Stratum intervention area. Graham Margaret, thank you. Um, can I thank the member for his question? Um, I do apologise, Mr Speaker, but this is an area that I know that my department is receiving a lot of questions about um, and that we would want um, to have a, a fulsome response for the members um, in um, the chamber. The identification of the projects uh, came about through an open market review 
um, and that identified the potential number of, of the potential number of premises that were available. Those then were looked at in conjunction with the already existing um, commercial <laughs> access to broadband, and that gave us the number that we are looking at within the project stratum intervention area. There are about three percent of other um, um, premises that we would like within that intervention area, and we are currently working with our national government um, to try to work out a solution for those premises, and will come back to the House as quickly as possible within that. I know that the member will be interested in this, but in West Tyrone, 9,591 premises will avail of superfast broadband um, due to Project Stratum. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Minister, so far for your answer. I, I first of all like to welcome the Minister for work in getting this rolled out. And indeed, we're now seeing confidence in supply money rolling into Northern Ireland, and we'll see now supply and confidence in our broadband. Uh, to all communities, I may add, all communities, some at the very start was very negative in their comments toward this, but this is going to be across all communities and support all of them. There's 18 constituencies in Northern Ireland, but obviously there's only one uh, Minister, the most important one, but Ulster. What's that, what's that going to do? What's that going to do for the average a homeowner, a pupil, student in Mid Ulster? Thank the member for his question. Um, in Mid Ulster, again, and I looked these up on the portal before coming here, 8,785 premises in Mid Ulster will benefit from next generation broadband thanks to the Project Stratum intervention. We've all seen how families have struggled with homeschooling, with homeworking um, during this pandemic. That will increase their ability um, to do these kind of things um, no end. It also, very importantly for the economy, and one of the key aspects um, of our economic uh, goals is to have a regionally balanced economy. And also, the new connectivity for the economy is fibre. And that will help us to get a regionally balanced economy so that rural areas where they might have been served with very poor broadband can now be connected and work in the same way as more urban settlements. I call John Blair. Speaker, thank you. And can I also thank the Minister for the uh, answers thus far? Um, in addition to those, can, can I ask what work is taking place uh, by the Department with groups such as the Community Fibre Partnership? to ensure that those areas not yet included and those that are harder to reach, and I have some of these in my constituency, I'm sure the Minister will have some in hers, that those areas can be included in this or future programmes. Well, as I have said um, to the Chamber um, in response to my other colleagues, um, there are a small number of premises um, that are still within that very hard to reach category um, that are um, outside the scope of the current project stratum and we are in discussions with the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and with Fibrous Networks as to how we can bring solutions to those premises. That, that will pro most probably be on a, a cost and a case-by-case -case basis but we are determined to try to have the best broadband services in the whole of the United Kingdom, if not Europe, for Northern Ireland. That's an enormous selling point when we look, go uh, to talk to investors uh, across the globe. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Project Stratum is indeed uh, a very welcome initiative, and uh, it couldn't come sooner. I'm just asking the Minister, really, what review mechanisms has she got in place, for example, if the project is delayed or if the rollout isn't just up to the standard or the expectations that her department has? I... I'm not anticipating uh, problems. I think that this is an exciting project. Um, I think the goal in this project is, is to give us a better connected economy, um, a more le regionally balanced economy. This is a really, really important initiative. Um, we have a project board um, and the different levels of um, guidance and, and, and governance uh, around the project and of course payment will be, de will be dependent uh, upon delivery and that's the most important element of this. I don't anticipate problems. There's always, there are always glitches in life 
but um, I'm looking forward to a smooth rollout um, and that by the first six to nine months of next year, that 19,000 properties in Northern Ireland that commercially would not have received this level of broadband will have it in their own homes. That will make an enormous difference. I call Cahill Boylan. Well, good afternoon, Cordia. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I welcome this announcement today? And the Minister knows that we've had a number of conversations in the corridors in relation, in relation to this project. I just want to uh, be a wee bit selfish and ask about Newry and Armagh, the, the number of premises in Newry and Armagh targeted, and the time frame for that. And more importantly, Minister, that this project is rolled out to most of those premises in the open countryside that has been waiting a number of years for broadband provision. Um, the member opposite and I clearly uh, understand how absolutely important this is for uh, rural communities across Northern Ireland and for the economic opportunity that this can bring to rural communities across Northern Ireland. Um, Project Stratum for Newry and Armagh will target 8,101 premises in uh, the Newry and Armagh constituency. Um, and that will give uh, an average coverage um, that um, have uh, next gen access to next generation broadband in that whole constituency of 99.5%. That's a pretty good record when we reach it. I call Pam Cameron. To number three, please. <clears throat> Can I thank the member there for her question? Um, I fully appreciate that many pubs have been asked to close under the regulation and as a result have had no income or limited income. It is vital that we provide support to prevent permanent pub closures and job losses. That is why I want to see these businesses receiving this additional top-up support as soon as possible. My department has been allocated a funding envelope of 10.6 million and is designing a scheme within that budget which will go forward to the executive for agreement. The aim of the scheme is to provide compensation to wet pubs that were required to remain closed under the health regulation restrictions for a further 12 work week period from the 4th of July to the 23rd of September when the rest of the hospitality sector were permitted to open and trade. I call Pam Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, I'm sure the Minister will agree that longer-term financial support may well be needed well into 2021 to assist the hospitality industry back onto its feet and protect those jobs following so many months of lost income this year. Can I ask the Minister how we can help the sector recover next year once the rollout of the vaccine is at a more advanced stage? Um, I've on record many, many times in this House as saying that the best way to help the economy is to have an economy that is open, that is functioning, and where people can go about their daily business. We are in the midst of a health pandemic that um, sadly has brought um, great suffering, I think, to the hospitality sector, and particularly to these traditional pubs who have not been able to open for pretty much uh, most of the year, maybe bar a week or two in uh, late September, October. And therefore, that is why it is incumbent upon us to try to bring the support to them. Um, I will be bringing forward the scheme to the executive. Um, hopefully this week, we are waiting uh, on details of verification checks. Um, and I know that the member will appreciate um, that it will have to be done in a way that we can uh, authenticate applications uh, and check them. Thank you. I call Kiva Archibald. And I thank the Minister for her responses so far and it will be welcome news to the sector that that is hopefully going to the executives this week. All of these schemes are really very welcome and last week the newly self-employed criteria were published and that scheme opened um, and it became apparent that some people will still be excluded on the basis of the criteria in particular in relation to the requirement for 50% of the trading income to have been from self-employment in 2019-20 and this will exclude those who um, became self-employed later in the year. Would the Minister commit to looking at that particular criteria to ensure those who previously missed get paid? 
Well, I am, of course, going to provide a full answer um, in relation to the self-employed scheme. Um, we launched the scheme specifically to deal with those who had access to uh, no um, any, in, any interventions whatsoever. Um, we have employed the same criteria broadly as the schemes in Scotland and Wales, um, and therefore and, uh, is in line with the criteria in the CES um, 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 self-employment scheme. Um, and therefore, um, that, is, that is why the scheme is designed and launched in the way that it was. We are, of course, always willing to look um, at any of these issues, um, but we would need to have a rationale. And the reason for the 50% is to make sure and protect those who are genuinely self-employed that this is their main source of income. I call Steve Aiken. Thank the Minister for her answers so far. And indeed, with the Minister and the Deputy Speaker's indulgence, I would like to uh, ask the question uh, Are the Executive looking to provide some sort of grant support for licensed sport and social clubs to help them make it through the rest of the winter? And could she indeed join me in welcoming and wishing Mr. Stuart Dixon a very happy birthday? That, that is st stretching the question, but I'll pass that to the Minister to decide if she wishes to respond. Mr Deputy Speaker, with, I could not resist. Um, I'm not going to sing it, but uh, I, I wish you a very, very happy birthday. And given all the challenges that you've been through, it's very welcome. Um, so <laughs> he's always willing to embarrass you at every opportunity, isn't he? Um, so... Um, Yes, um, those uh, licensed premises who have been closed and have been instructed to close will be available to apply in the same way as others um, who have applied for other grant schemes. Moving on, I call Cara Hunter. Thank you. And Mr Deputy Speaker, question five, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you for the question. The executive has agreed a funding allocation of 10 million to support the newly self-employed. The newly self-employed support scheme opened at 6 p.m. on the 3rd of December and will provide financial support to newly self-employed individuals whose business is adversely impacted by COVID and have not been able to access support from the UK government's self-employed income support scheme. The scheme will provide a one-off taxable grant of 3,500, enabling support for approximately 2,900 newly self-employed individuals. Invest Northern Ireland will deliver the scheme on behalf of the Department for the Economy, and the scheme will close to applications at 6 p.m. on the 7th of January 2021. At scheme closure, any underspend will be considered and a top-up grant may be paid to eligible applicants. Details of the eligibility criteria, along with an el eligibility checker, can be found on the NI Business Info website. I call Cara Hunter for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for her answer. Minister, <clears throat> can I ask if, in addition to the support scheme for the self-employed workers, uh, if your department is any further forward in developing a scheme that directors of limited companies can avail of? My uh, department is indeed in the process of uh, developing uh, a scheme um, for limited companies. Um, again, this is... Um, one that we want to discuss uh, the eligibility um, with various uh, business organisations who deal with these issues. We're in the process of doing that um, and uh, will continue to do so as quickly as possible. May I put on the record, Mr Deputy Sp Speaker, today that currently in my department we're managing the COVID uh, restrictions scheme, Part A and B. We've launched the self-employment scheme. We have almost finished working up the scheme for traditional pubs. Um, we have a scheme waiting for large hospitality, um, another scheme for uh, bed and breakfast uh, organ um, businesses, and of course we are working very, very much on the high street stimulus scheme. And I want to pay tribute to the officials from my department for the work that they are doing to support businesses in Northern Ireland. That is an enormous workload on top of all of the other day-to-day -day issues. I call Christopher Stolfer. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and also can I associate myself with the comments of Mr Aiken, although I wouldn't dare to guess what birthday it is that Mr Dixon is celebrating. I wouldn't wish to 
offend or compliment him in, uh, in making a guess at that. The scale of the challenge that the minister faces in stimulating the economy is reflected in the fact that she put a, a bid in for £390 million and received roughly a third of that from the finance minister. And this is not real money in the sense of the economy generating actual new money. This is government money that will ultimately have to be paid back. Does the minister, or can the minister today, commit to using her influence and power in the executive to push for the fastest easing of restrictions on economic activity that safety will allow? Because it is absolutely essential that our people are allowed to get back to work. I think the member and members across this House will be absolutely in no doubt that um, a fully functioning economy um, is required to be open, to be devoid of restrictions, etc. But I do recognise that we are in the middle of very difficult health circumstances. And my advice would be, like my colleague Robin Swan, to advise people to be respectful of each other, to remember the rules, wash your hands, keep your distance, wear your face mask. If we do these things, then we can have an economy that is freer and more open and able to trade. And I noticed today that the first woman in the world to receive uh, the vaccine, um, although she lives in Coventry, we'll forgive her for that, but she's from Northern Ireland. Um, and I, I, I take that as a great sign of hope um, for, for uh, the future, recognising, of course, that this is a mammoth challenge uh, that we have in getting the vaccine rolled out. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, Minister, I want to return to the self-employed and the newly self-employed. I understand that representatives of the self-employed are bringing forward proposals to the Minister which would in fact meet her objectives of ensuring that the public purse is protected and that money is going to those most in need. Will the Minister take those proposals seriously and undertake to assist those who are newly self-employed? I think the member knows well enough uh, that I receive delegations of people from right across the spectrum of Northern Ireland and I will treat uh, their um, representations uh, to me uh, with respect um, and uh, look at all of the suggestions that are put forward. Uh, Rachel Woods is not in her place. We now move on to a uh, call, Rosemary, Dix Rosemary Barton. Question seven, Minister. Can I uh, thank the member um, for her question? Um, given uh, the tweets that we have just seen um, and uh, some of the, the issues that have been aired today, it is indeed very, very timely. Since I took office, my priority has been to ensure Northern Ireland businesses continue to enjoy unfettered access to our large market in Great Britain. I have engaged with our government on a regular basis to ensure this, and I am pleased that those efforts are yielding results. Unfettered access can be guaranteed by the United Kingdom through the Internal Market Bill by agreement in the Joint Committee. And I note the latest reports, but I also note um, that I, and I think this House should note, that I spoke to businesses this morning and all agree that a pragmatic and uh, practical outcome is uh, absolutely desired. The SI covering goods from Northern Ireland into GB is, in my view, too vague. It is not a fulsome definition of a Northern Ireland qualifying good. And while international trade, including which measures will be taken to ensure that EU goods do not use Northern Ireland as a backdoor to the GB market, are for the United Kingdom government, it is important that the quality and provenance of Northern Ireland goods is preserved. The government has yet to outline specific anti-avoidance measures which would be used against EU businesses who are attempting to avoid tariffs through bringing goods into Northern Ireland. I welcome the commitment to developing a sustainer longer term qualifying definition and anti-avoidance measures. Engagement with industry and the executive on this is essential. The executive has written to the government supporting proposals from NIFTA, which would act as an effective model for the agri-food sector, ensuring unfettered access. I call Rosemary Barton for supplementary. 
Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, can you advise on the country of origin of goods that have been uh, produced using products from several countries? For example, cheese or Bailey's, Bailey's uh, drink, etc. The member will be glad to know. I actually spoke um, to um, the chief executive of Dairy UK this morning in this um, very precise issue. And I'm presuming that the member refers to um, um, milk um, in Northern Ireland, maybe processed in the Republic of Ireland uh, into cheese, etc., etc. And we do need a practical outcome to this so that it is uh, treated, if it's done in this way, um, as a, a product of origin of one or other. Um, but most importantly, what we need to ensure for all of our produce is that um, we have free access to the EU market in this uh, respect, but that we also have access to our biggest market. And again, I'll repeat it because it's worth repeating. Northern Ireland sells more in the Great Britain market than it does in the Republic of Ireland, the rest of Europe, and the rest of the world all added together. That unfettered access to GB is absolutely vital. I call Declan McLear. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, the Minister made reference to the uh, anti-avoidance measures that the British Government are supposed to put in place to prevent the North becoming a back uh, door into the, the British market. That has the potential to become a huge impediment to trade uh, from uh, heading head east. And there's only really 23 days ago towards the end of the transition period. Does she have any assessment or any sense of what shape these anti-avoidance measures might uh, take? Well, as I said in my um, answer uh, to the question, um, the government has said that they would bring in anti-avoidance measures. I think those are likely to be measures around um, asking firms to prove that they are not using a particular route through Northern Ireland in order to avoid uh, duty on the particular goods that they are bringing into the GB market. For Northern Ireland, there are a couple of things that are massively important. We want to preserve our place within the United Kingdom's internal market. As I have said, it is the most important market for Northern Ireland, and I know the member will be extremely interested in, for agri-food in, in particular. It's absolutely vital that we preserve that place. Equally vital um, that we preserve the provenance of Northern Ireland goods so that Northern Ireland isn't seen as a bit of a, a backwater, a backdoor, where anybody and everybody can bring goods in to the GB market. I think that would undermine us in the GB market and undermine the value and provenance of Northern Ireland goods, and that is massively, massively important as well. I call Matthew O'Toole. Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't know if the Minister has seen, but in the last hour there has been news that at the Joint Committee there has been some agreement going forward. She, like me, will want to see the detail of that agreement between uh, Minister Gove and Vice President Sefcovic. But can I ask her, pursuant to that, once we see the detail, is she willing, uh, with others in the Executive, to press for full access for uh, Northern Ireland businesses to existing EU trade deals. That's something that via the Joint Committee we should be able to agree that we do get that access both to uh, UK deals and of course the UK market, and I agree with her on that, but also those existing EU trade deals. That offers real opportunity for businesses here. It's also essential for the members business, asked particularly the dairy business. Thank you. I think the Chief Executive of UK, Dairy UK will be very pleased that uh, we were listening to him this morning. Um, I, um, like you, uh, will want to see the detail of what has been agreed. Um, I have read the statement um, that has uh, followed uh, the discussions this morning that have been ongoing for a number of days. And as I've said in this House on many, many occasions, for Northern Ireland, for the rest of the United Kingdom, it would be better if we were able to achieve that zero tariff, zero quota deal. And I think that we need the practical outcomes um, for the, the protocol to be agreed. Um, as I said in, in an earlier answer, we can do them either through the Internal Market Bill, but um, we could also do those with the agreement of the EU 
through um, the Joint Committee. So I will be very interested in the outcome of those discussions uh, today and particularly when the Minister makes a statement to the House tomorrow uh, in relation to those. It is important on trade deals that we have access, and this is a, a huge, huge issue for us, that we have access to those trade deals that the United Kingdom will do as new. When, uh, of the 37 trade deals that the EU has, most of those, bar I think about three now, are actually rolled over. So as members of the United Kingdom, we will have automatic access to those EU rolled over trade deals. Um, what we really need to make sure is that we have access to the new trade deals, that trade deal with the US, that trade deal with New Zealand, that trade deal with Australia, and that we have that access on the same basis as every other part of the United Kingdom. And that is the end of our period of time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Paula Bradshaw. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, can I ask what proposals you have to bring forward a scheme to assist PAYE earners excluded from both furlough and from the newly self-employed support scheme? Thank you. Um, I'm presuming the member means the self-employed scheme, the CES scheme, the national scheme, um, and uh, the, the scheme that we currently have. Well, as I have indicated, um, we are currently, or we have launched um, a scheme um, for the self-employed. That's for those who became self-employed um, after uh, March 2019, um, and therefore are, sorry, 20, yes, 2019, and therefore could not have supplied a tax return um, to HMRC before COVID struck us in March 2020. Uh, the scheme that we have brought forward is um, the, broadly the same scheme as that is, that was developed in Scotland uh, and uh, in Wales. Um, and uh, I look forward uh, to those who uh, have not been able to access any support, being able to access support through that uh, particular scheme. Um, those who, um, I, and I'm presuming again that the member is talking about those people who um, were... Um, maybe became self-employed, say, in 2018 or maybe late in 2019, for whom CES has not been a particularly successful outcome. Um, those are not with, included within our scheme. Those that would require a completely separate scheme. Of course, that will be up to the executive to decide whether um, they will, because then they will be getting into the position of topping up national schemes, and they will have to decide whether that's a position that they want to get into um, and whether the finance minister is the funding for the same. I call Paul Bradshaw for supplementary. Um, thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your response. Yeah, uh, the, res the correspondence I've received from constituents recently, including um, where they're frustrated that when they've applied for the self-employed um, self support scheme, is that there seems to be a mismatch in the definitions used between the GoFert programme and what the department are using in terms of eligibility. Is that something that you could look into? Because a lot of the, the people who fall between the cracks, as you know, Minister, are in very dire straits and um, this is having such an impact on their mental well-being. Um, I am completely aware uh, of how difficult life has been um, over um, the last number of months. And that is why in the three support schemes that we brought out in the early part of the year, we paid out over £340 million um, to those individuals uh, who required help. I am absolutely also aware that that didn't cover everyone who needed help, which is why we have now specifically targeted that particular group of the self-employed who were not able to access the national self-employed scheme. Um, and that's a very, very important distinction. The criteria um, was developed in line with the criteria that um, the group excluded, um, uh, the excluded group had actually uh, brought forward and is in line with the criteria that was used in both the Scottish and Welsh schemes of the same nature. I call Gary Middleton. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister will be aware that there's a lot of media attention around the discussions and the agreement around the UK and the EU and the Northern Protocol. Uh, would the Minister agree that it is vital that an overall trade deal is reached to support our businesses here in Northern Ireland? And does she support uh, a flexibility or a grace period for local companies as they try to adopt new arrangements post 1st of January? 
Um, can I thank my colleague for the question? Um, it is important that we reach a deal. I've said many times that is the best outcome for Northern Ireland. And it is important that we reach a conclusion to the issues that the protocol have thrown up uh, for Northern Ireland. I don't support the protocol. I'm not pretending about it to anyone in this House. Everyone knows my view. But we have practical issues to resolve for the good of the business community and the economy in Northern Ireland and to support jobs. And that's important. I spoke to my EU stakeholders group this morning. That's made up of a very wide range of businesses across Northern Ireland. Um, and we agreed um, that uh, with the statement of the business leaders yesterday that a period of ease, of adjustment, would be necessary given the lateness of the hour of uh, the agreement. And of course, uh, we will reserve judgment on the agreement until we actually see the details of the same. I call Gary Middleton. Can I thank the Minister for her uh, response and I do welcome the comments that she has made. Uh, like herself, I think it is important that we do wait and see the detail. Uh, but will the Minister continue to raise the concerns around the protocol? This morning I met with airlines along with colleagues and they raised some serious issues about the impact of what the protocol will have on them. Uh, so will the Minister co to, uh, commit to continue to raise those issues on their behalf? I absolutely will. I think that um, what we will possibly see from uh, the um, discussions in the Joint Committee are high-level agreements um, that will come out over the next number of days. But underneath that, there are always a myriad of practical issues that need to be resolved that the protocol has imposed upon us. And for those in this House who call for the full implementation of the protocol, I would advise you to step in my shoes for just a short period of time and listen to the difficulties of businesses who struggle with the complexities of customs and health uh, export certificates uh, and the cost to businesses. And again, very importantly for this House and something that we need um, to keep um, the, the, our government um, reminded of is the cost to business and the promise of our government to actually um, make sure that businesses do not have to bear that cost themselves. I call Pat Sheehan. Good, uh, Kion Korda. Uh, Minister, the, the black taxis play a very valuable role in the tourism sec uh, sector in my constituency, and indeed in other constituencies in Belfast. These drivers provide guided tours for tourists throughout the city, which in turn benefits hoteliers and other accommodation providers. And while you have uh, provided multiple grants to hotels and accommodation providers, you continue to exclude taxi drivers and the coach industry. Uh, and I wonder, would you give a commitment today, Minister, to amend Part B of the Coronavirus Business Support Scheme so that taxi drivers and coach operators can uh, uh, access additional payments on top of the rather meagre payments they get from the Department of Infrastructure? Well, of course, uh, the member will understand uh, that the responsibility for looking after taxi drivers, coach and haulage uh, industry um, is with the Department of Infrastructure. Um, they are the department that regulate the same, um, and they are the department that have brought forward the scheme in relation to the same. The scheme, uh, the COVID restrictions uh, scheme, um, is meant to look after the supply chain of those businesses that are named within the restrictions. Um, so they have to be named and they have to be in their direct supply chain, i.e. have a contract with that. However, the best way to support uh, the taxi drivers is to have an open economy, a free economy, and of course, absolutely, and one of the most uh, utmost priority pieces of work that we will do in the next year is to restart and reboot our tourism economy so that we can see those people come back to Northern Ireland and we will make sure that jobs in that sector are secure for the future. I believe we have a lot to offer in Northern Ireland for tourism um, and I look forward to working with the sector to have, see that renewal um, and I hope to make announcements about that in the near future. I call Pat Sheehan for supplementary. Good morning. Good morning. And I have to say, Minister, I'm very disappointed with that answer. Um, taxi drivers in particular, who under normal circumstances work very long and antisocial hours for very little recompense, 
uh, have been left behind in this pandemic. Uh, it took a long, long time to get the scheme from the Department of Infrastructure launched. And, and you have the power and as to... The, has, the minister, has the member a question? ...to amend Part B of the Coronavirus Business Support Scheme, which would ensure that taxi drivers and coach operators get additional payments. Um, I certainly sympathise uh, with either taxi drivers or coach operators. Since there is already a scheme um, where they have made their application, where those applications have been verified, if the executive decides that um, there should be additional funding for that scheme to satisfy um, additional hardship payments, I, of course, would support that. I call William Irwin. Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the Minister is aware the impact of COVID on the economy has been unprecedented. I understand that a number of initiatives exist to help people stay in work or find new employment. Is Northern Ireland part of the Kickstart programme that was launched in GB? Um, can I thank the member for his question? Um, and much of what we do in the Department of the Economy is to support the broader economy um, and to support training and uh, initiatives uh, within the economy. That's why we launched our apprenticeship schemes. Um, which um, are um, being received well by industry, creating new apprenticeships and supporting others. Um, Kickstart is uh, the Department of Economy scheme, no, the Department of Community scheme, sorry, Department of Community scheme. Um, and I did speak with the Minister some months ago when Kickstart uh, was announced uh, in the United Kingdom. I understand that she is working up a scheme um, but, um, and um, would, would be encourage her to bring it forward as quickly as possible. I call William Irwin for supplementary. I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that it is vitally important that every effort is made to help many of these businesses. Absolutely. Um, make sure that it is really important to help uh, businesses. It's really important uh, to help individuals uh, as well. And perhaps the House, uh, in the closing minutes of this uh, question time, might want to uh, know that um, Part A of the COVID restriction scheme um, has um, received 3,603 applications. Um, and um, to date, um, 2,544 of those have been paid, with over 12 million being given uh, to individuals in this period of restrictions. Um, and we hope to have all of the scheme in Part A fully paid out by the end of the week, um, except for the perhaps the one or two that are very much more difficult to do. Part B um, of the COVID restriction scheme will start paying this week with significant payments today and on Friday. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. Minister, you have uh, answered questions in relation to Project Stratum, and I want to add my full support uh, to uh, that project and the progress in terms of uh, uh, Fibros being uh, given the contract. I am, however, somewhat concerned about the timeline in terms of increasing broadband coverage in West Tyrone and Fermanagh and South Tyrone. Given that these constituencies are somewhat the worst impacted in terms of connectivity, Minister, uh, can you give your assessment on the need to prioritise both of these areas in terms of the rollout? Well, of course, I have made my view uh, very clear on this. and uh, The contract was awarded so that uh, the company that um, uh, would get the contract would be able um, to roll out the contract in a way that made most economic and technical sense. If we start to actually prioritise one area here and one area there and one area somewhere else, then what we will do is we will make the contract more expensive and less bus our less homes and premises will be included within the contract area. I, like you, um, and for my constituents who also need uh, to see uh, broadband in their particular area as quickly as possible would like to see um, me being able to chop and change things around. That's not the way it's going to work. We are rolling it out in the most uh, economic and technically um, sensible way uh, to get the most that we can and the most premises that we can from the contract. 
I call Daniel McCrossan for a very quick supplementary. Thank you, Minister. West Tyrone is somewhat worse, but I, I do understand we have to defend our constituents. Minister, um, can you outline uh, whether any assessment has been undertaken with the Minister for Education, your colleague, on the impact of Project Shadow will have in terms of boosting uh, broadband connectivity in rural schools? I haven't specifically spoken to the Minister of Education on this particular issue, um, but we all know um, that connectivity is key. It is king, um, and fibre is the new method of connectivity. Um, and that will bring, and Project Stratum will bring economic opportunity to your constituents in West Tyrone on an equal basis to those who live in more larger urban settlements. I think that's a good thing, um, and a good thing for families and farm and, and jobs uh, in uh, the West Tyrone area. Um, and I look forward to seeing it roll out. And that is the end of our period of time of questions to the Minister for the Economy. I have asked members to take their ease for a few moments.